have the pleasure to introduce to you Valerie Fagin, the top epidemiologist in the world on stroke, really, and one of the core persons of this work, really. So, Valerie, you will speak about global stroke epidemiology and projections, cost and prevention strategies. The floor is yours, Valerie. Thank you, Bro. Good evening. This is my disclosure. I am given this presentation on behalf of 223 commissioners, co-authors of this paper, representing 80 countries across all continents of the world. And as it has already been alluded before, uh, stroke burden is increasing across all countries in the world. And there is a significant increase in the lifetime risk of stroke from what it was in the late 90s to now, the lifetime risk of stroke increased by 50%. And now one in four of us will have a stroke in a lifetime if no effective preventative strategies are used and implemented. Stroke is also no longer a disease of the elderly. And uh, we had um, a pleasure to hear a presentation from one of the stroke survivors in Canada earlier this afternoon. And as she was informed at that time, stroke is a disease of the elderly. So not anymore. 63% of strokes are happening in people younger than 70 years old. It, the number of stroke survivors is increasing very sharply, not exponentially, but close to exponential increase. And just over the last um, 30 years, the number of stroke survivors has doubled. What is even more worrisome is the increase in the incidence of stroke in young individuals, people younger than 55 years old. We enjoyed decrease in stroke incidence for decades and mortality rates a decrease in decades. But now, over the last uh, 20 years, we are witnessing increase in the incidence of stroke in young people, younger than 55. In that delicate meta-analysis done by Peter Roswell's group from Oxford University, they showed very convincingly that in people younger than 55 years, the incidence rates has increased statistically significantly, and the number of population-based studies used for that meta-analysis are shown on this slide compared to the decrease in older age group population. And this increase is not by accident. It is because we also observe a significant increase in the prevalence of major risk factors for stroke, particularly for young age group of the population, people younger than uh, 70 years old. As you can see, blood pressure, elevated blood pressure, excessive body weight, plasma glucose, all on the increase, both uh, crude, not adjust, age-adjusted, and age-adjusted um, uh, prevalence. We also not very successful in the prevention of recurrent stroke. In that meta-analysis, it was shown that over the last 20 years, there was no significant decrease in the uh, rate or risk of recurrent stroke. As it was about 20, 25 percent 20 years ago, it remains largely unchanged in, the, in most of the countries, with some exemptions, of course. And also worrisome, we are also witnessing a widening, a gap between low middle income countries and high income countries in terms of the burden of stroke, as you can see here. It, one of the uh, 
um, uh, projections of the uh, number of deaths expected in the world. As you can see, the number of deaths, disability-adjusted life years lost, and economic burden of stroke from 2020 to 2050 will project, is projected to double. And the burden, bulk burden of stroke still resides in low to middle income countries. If the total cost of stroke to the global economy in 2017 was about $900 billion a year, by 2050, it is projected to reach over $2 trillion a year. It is an enormous economic and medical burden that we are going to expect if no changes in the uh, prevention will happen. So we all uh, now understand that we actually failed in prevention of stroke. And we also failed in the, in the achievement of sustainable development goals, as uh, you can see from the quote by the Secretary General of the United Nations. So need to be changed, need to be changed our approach in many aspects of stroke care prevention and rehabilitation. And the only strategy that could reduce the incidence of stroke and eventually the whole burden of stroke is prevention, primary prevention first of all. So why currently use strategies in stroke prevention and cardiovascular prevention are not actually working? There are two mainstream strategies for stroke and cardiovascular disease prevention, and they all were described first by uh, Professor Jeffrey Rose in his historical publication almost 40 years ago. And there are two strategies, population-wide prevention strategy, when uh, decreasing the exposure to risk factors is applied across the whole population all age group, ethnic groups, regardless of the level of risk. And good example of that is smoking cessation campaign, um, currently run in many countries in the world, quite successful campaign. Undoubtedly, it is the most cost-effective prevention strategy, because it allows to prevent not only stroke, but the whole range of non-communicable disorders that share common risk factors with stroke. However, there are some uh, obstacles in implementation of that strategy, such as legislative, uh, legislative changes it requires, industry opposition to changing um, uh, exposure to smoking, for example, reducing uh, smoking exposure. Uh, huge opposition because it costs money to the industry. And most expensive part of the population-wide strategy is addressing the grassroots of all non-communicable disorders. Uh, poverty, socioeconomic inequalities in the society, and addressing that task requires enormous financial um, efforts. However, as I said, it is still the most cost-effective strategy. It is need to be done by the government. What health professionals are responsible for is individual uh, prevention strategy, and we currently have commonly used high cardiovascular risk prevention strategy. It is good in the terms that it allows integrative approach to primary prevention, not addressing one or two individual risk factors, but allowing holistically assess the risk 
of having cardiovascular disease based on the combination of risk factors. It's also very good for monitoring progress of uh, success or failure in primary uh, cardiovascular disease prevention. But it is mainly used for determining thresholds above which people uh, need to be treated with blood pressure lowering or lipid lowering medication. That's one of the main purpose of the high cardiovascular risk strategy. And by definition, it is targeting high cardiovascular risk people. But the problem with cardiovascular disease and stroke is that most strokes and myocardial infarction are happening exactly in the opposite group of people, people with low to moderate risk of cardiovascular disease. 80% of strokes and myocardial infarction are happening in low to moderate risk people. The other limitation of that strategy is a heavy emphasis on treatment. That was one of the purpose of implementing that strategy. It was believed that that strategy will allow more people eligible for pharmacological treatment of hypertension and uh, high cholesterol. By labeling people as low and moderate risk, this strategy actually demotivates people at that low or moderate risk to do anything about their risk factors. And I will show that demotivational aspect of high cardiovascular risk strategy in a few uh, seconds on another slide. And last but not least, uh, there is no evidence that high cardiovascular risk strategy is actually effective and cost effective, rather opposite. In the a large um, Cochrane um, meta-analysis of 15 randomized controlled trials, totaling over 250 randomized patients, in some of those uh, trials, patients followed from a um, few months to 10 years, screening for cardiovascular risk though not specifically high cardiovascular risk, just cardiovascular risk, including high cardiovascular risk individuals, was shown completely non-effective. As you can see on the slopes, they overlap. Confidence intervals uh, are not shown, but you can imagine. They all overlap. There is no even a positive trend that screening for cardiovascular risk will reduce incidence or mortality from either stroke or ischemic heart disease. And this conclusion was recently, in 2021, supported by meta-analysis of the WHO experts. And perhaps their statement is actually a bit overstatement, but I would like to quote it as it is in the paper. Based on several high-quality randomized controlled trials that included a large number of participants, the overall results clearly showed that screening for cardiovascular disease risk and cardiovascular disease risk factors has had no impact on lowering cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality in the general population. Moreover, serious adverse events were identified, uh, for example, increased mortality. It, it, I think it is a, a little bit overstatement because um, no evidence of efficacy does not equal there is evidence of no efficacy. But Anyway, no evidence for efficacy uh, of cardiovascular disease strategy currently exists. And there is a low uptake of that strategies in the country 
countries where such strategy is implemented as a mandatory screening tool in countries such as UK, um, Australia, and New Zealand. The maximum uptake of that strategy, even with financial incentives of um, health professionals, uh, GPs, is only about 20%. And uh, researchers from UK, when they analyzed cost effectiveness um, of the uh, um, HAS health check programs, which is basically cardiovascular risk programs, they estimated that pre to prevent one death uh, from whatever causes, it requires almost half million pounds. Such cost can hardly be regarded as a cost-effective strategy. And based on the lack of evidence for efficacy, low uptake, and high cost of that strategy, many experts believe and compare cardi high cardiovascular risk strategy uh, with a naked emperor in analogy, analogy with the famous uh, fairy tale of Swedish Hans Christian Andersen, the new dress for the emperor. However, this limitation recently started to be acknowledged and re um, re recognized by World Health Organization. And you all know that in 2021, there was a new guideline uh, for the pharmacological management of hypertension in adults that clearly stated that um, pharmacological management of hypertension should not be solely you, uh, based on uh, high cardiovascular risk threshold. It should be based on the value of blood, uh, blood pressure and other conditions, which is um, quite a deviation from initial statements and initial guidelines, which are still in many international guidelines. Just uh, cardiovascular risk threshold. Now it is changed. The other positive change in the World Health Organization, which also acknowledged the limitation of high, high cardiovascular risk strategy, is a recent, um, just this year, endorsement of polypeel as, um, as the mean for uh, primary cardiovascular disease prevention. So what are the main uh, problems with currently use cardiovascular, high cardiovascular risk prevention strategies in some details? First uh, limitation or roadblock I would like to mention is the lack of motivation. As I mentioned uh, before, 80% of people screened for cardiovascular risk are labeled low to moderate risk. And I will show you how this demotivates people to do anything about their risk factors. Without motivation, people do not change their behavior. They would not even take medications they prescribe. Medic motivation is the first and most important driving force for changing behavior. There is still low awareness uh, about stroke across uh, the globe. Uh, there are a number of publications on the population of awareness of stroke warning signs, symptoms, risk factors, and it did not change over the last 20 years. Still very low awareness. And that also a component of low motivation to do anything to prevent stroke. Another uh, roadblock is the cost. If someone would like to prevent stroke or cardiovascular disease and attend a health professional, it costs money. High cardiovascular risk strategy requires blood lipid um, assessment. Well, there is um, um, algorithms that don't, do not require 
uh, lipid assessment. But still, um, attending a doctor, for whatever reason, costs money. And when a significant proportion of the world population live on $5 a, a month, this is impossible task for them to complete. So this strategy is certainly not applicable to low resource countries, uh, low income people. The other big limitation is lack of time by clinicians. When they see patients, they, um, patients come with their health problems and to spend time kind of for opportunistic primary prevention, they don't have time. They acknowledge the importance of that, but they simply have no time for that. And last but not least, there is still no, until recently, motivational digital tools for lay people and clinicians to be used to save their time for uh, implementation of those primary or secondary stroke prevention recommendations. Um, and um, this is a big obstacle uh, uh, in implementing prevention strategies. This is the example how demotivational is a high cardiovascular risk strategy. Let's take an example of 40 years old uh, man, as you can see, uh, not much physically active, who smokes and has a blood pressure of 140 systolic. If you use currently uh, available algorithms for calculating 10-year absolute risk of cardiovascular disease, his risk is 0.8 extremely low, he will undoubtedly labeled as low-risk individual. And if he is told that his risk is very low, he may start thinking, oh, I'm protected from having cardiovascular disease and stroke. He may start thinking about eating junk food or doing some other silly, silly things because he's protected. But if you apply relative risk approach for estimating risk using, for example, stroke riskometer app, his relative risk is 2.3, and compared to someone of his age, sex, ethnicity, but without additional risk factors. And that would make him think, oh, why I'm having two times risk than my peer? and how I can reduce that risk. So that's the first element of motivation. There are a number of other motivational techniques, but that's one of them. So then why we have a bias towards high cardiovascular risk strategy compared to population-wide strategy, which is not implemented in full in any country in the world? I think one of the main reasons was quite rightfully um, emphasized 15 years ago by Professor Capewell from UK. It is easy to tick a box, screening done, prevention accomplished. And that's exactly what's happening. It's easy to report for policymakers, for officials, Oh, we did screening, 100% population screened for cardiovascular risk. Great, we did the prevention. I think there is also another reason for uh, a quite um, a wide use of high cardiovascular risk strategy and support from many organizations. It, it relates to industry because one of the main output of high cardiovascular risk strategy is to determine threshold for about which people need to be prescribed blood pressure lowering or lipid lowering medications. Apparently, industry in, is interested in, in it as well. So what the challenge? The challenge is to balance high cardiovascular risk strategy and population-wide strategy 
the only way to achieve it is to cover not only high cardiovascular risk individuals, but individuals at any level of increased risk in the population. Basically making a bridge be between high cardiovascular risk strategy and population-wide strategy and properly evidence-based dress of the emperor, uh, emperor of medicine prevention. That's the challenge. And that's what we try to solve in our Lancet Commission. And the first, of course, strategy we are advocating is the population-wide strategy. It, uh, the strategy um, component of that are well known, and I would not repeat it. But when we talk to officials, government officials, about that, they say, oh, we all understand that we support it, but we have no money to implement it. And this is completely wrong. They do have money. If we stay on the basis or foundation of evidence-based medicine, all the officials, everyone must admit that the most robust evidence for reducing exposure to unhealthy products is taxation. That's where most the evidence, randomized controlled trials, confirmed it beyond any doubts. And if governments, each and every government in the world, introduce taxation on unhealthy products, such as alcohol, tobacco, of course, um, salt, sugary drinks, uh, products with trans, trans fats, the revenue from uh, such taxation would be enormous. It would allow not only prevention, not only stroke, across all diseases, it would allow uh, developing perfect health delivery systems. It would also be sufficient to address poverty. In some countries, taxations from these uh, products could reach half of the gross national product. You can imagine how much money it is. It can be used for uh, every good purposes, but only if it, uh, uh, those revenues are invested back into the people, health, people well-being. And if people would know that they ta no one likes taxation, but if they would know that their taxation, revenue from that, their taxation will go back to them, they will support it. But governments need to be transparent in spending that revenue. Then everything will be perfect. And that's what we call upon all governments. They need to introduce such taxations because it, uh, it actually kills one, uh, two, two birds with one, one stone. It reduces exposure to unhealthy products. Itself, it will reduce the incidence of all major non-communicable disorders, including stroke. And it uh, produces revenue for further uh, financing of other intervention for in, increasing well-being of, of people. So that's on the population level. This is responsibility of the governments. On the individual level, the Lancet Commission endorsed the use of polypill uh, for people 45 to 75 years old, that age break, who are at the intermediate risk of cardiovascular disease for primary prevention. Now it is endorsed by the World Health Organization. The other major inter novel intervention we um, um, advocate for is uh, task shifting in, in primary prevention from doctors to health volunteers in low to middle income countries because doctors do not have time for, for, for the prevention, actually effective um, motivational prevention to be implemented. And in high income countries, task shifting from doctors to nurses, nurse educators. The third uh, main pillar of uh, novel 
primary and secondary prevention intervention we advocate is to apply prevention on the individual level to people at any level of increased stroke or cardiovascular disease risk, regardless of the level of risk. And for that, we also recommend to use digital technologies, validated digital technology, technologies internationally and in, in, endorsed, such as free stroke riskometer app or for lay people or prevents MD uh, web app for health professionals. Those technologies um, uh, not only validated, but they also received a number of national and international awards, such as World um, Stroke Organization President's Award, uh, World Health Organization uh, Eastern Pacific Innovation Challenge Award, and most recently New Zealand Prime Minister um, Science Prize. Of course, this complex work needs to be supported and, uh, and in, uh, requires engagement with a number of major stakeholders, ideally under the umbrella of the universal health coverage. With all these measures in place, we expect to uh, improve, reduce, actually, stroke incidence from theoretically um, um, proposed 11% when high cardiovascular risk strategy is used to up to 50%. And that would, uh, with motivational uh, and uh, primary stroke prevention strategy, task shifting and polypeel. And that could be also further increased up to 80% with population-wide strategy. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize, as Bo uh, stated yesterday in uh, um, our Lancet Commission video, uh, publication, Lancet publication is just the beginning. The hard work is ahead. And I would like to call upon not only commissioners of that paper, but I would like to call upon all health professionals, policy makers, each and every one of you actually, and internationally to uh, actually roll up uh, our sleeves and start fighting, um, fighting the global pandemic of stroke. We can do it and let's do it and do it now. Thank you.